plants and animals and uh, as a consequence of that I got interested in, in conservation and environment issues and as a consequence of that I got interested in politics and the political process because I learned that it was governments which for better or for worse made the decisions which determined those things. And I always worried about uh, population because I realised that it was we who were doing the environmental damage. You know, we, we have seen the enemy and it is us. But I, I believe the demographers who said that population would take care of itself. Now, over the years, their projections have turned out to be wrong, always under underestimates, uh, and so I've stopped listening to them. And as recently as this week, the Australian Bureau of Statistics released its latest set of projections, and surprise, surprise, they were up again, 37.5 million by 2050 instead of 35 or 36 million, and possibly even as high as 70 million by 2100. Uh, back in 2009, I uh, helped kick-start a national debate about this issue, uh, arguing that 36 million by 2050 was too many. And I made the, the points about endangered species, about climate change, about traffic congestion, about uh, housing affordability, about uh, urban blight, planning in the cities, cost of living, and so on. And there was a debate about Big Australia, and in 2010 I felt there was some movement, there were statements from the Greens, statements from the Liberals around Easter, Kevin Rudd announced the Minister for Population, and when Julia Gillard became Prime Minister, she renounced the idea of Big Australia. But the election came and went, uh, and there was no action on this front. Uh, and I, I still don't know why Julia never delivered on this. I think that if she had done so, she might still be Prime Minister today. But I, I do observe that in political debate, people are very frightened about being called racist or xenophobic. And, and this is true of Prime Ministers and of ordinary people in the street. Uh, yes, there are racists out there. It is a pity. It is true. But the use of the term racism has become a new kind of McCarthyism used to stifle debate. Uh, just as there were communists in the 1950s, but the fear of communists was used in an hysterical way to shut down and discredit and attack all kinds of political ideas that McCarthyists dislike, so too we see name-calling used to stifle and shut down debate on things that desperately need to be debated. How do we counter this? Well, this is not easy, but first, we need to point out that Australia is already a multiracial society. Uh, one quarter of Australians were born overseas, and one half have either one or both parents born overseas. So the bird has flown. I don't come across people trying to maintain Australia as a white Anglo-Saxon outpost of the British Empire. It is too late. It cannot be done. I do not come across people who are trying. As a consequence of our multiracial society, our actions will assist and are intended to assist Victorians of all backgrounds. Uh, for example, Broadmeadows, just to the north of my electorate, has double-digit unemployment. Uh, many unemployed people in Broadmeadows are of Turkish background, and they are entitled to our consideration, rather than running migrant worker programs that stuff up their ability to find work. The third thing is that if talking about population makes us, makes us racist, uh, then we are in pretty good company. Uh, people don't normally think of Dr Martin Luther King as a white supremacist. Uh, what, what did he have to say about population? And I quote, Family planning to relate population to world resources is possible, practical and necessary. Unlike plagues of the dark ages or contemporary diseases we do not yet understand, the modern plague of overpopulation is solvable by means we have discovered and with resources we possess. What is lacking is not sufficient knowledge of the problem, but universal consciousness of its gravity and the education of billions who are its victims. And people wouldn't normally think of uh, Dr David Suzuki as a puppet or fellow traveller of Pauline Hanson. Uh, what did he have to say about population? Dr Suzuki said, of course, 
Human numbers are at the very core of our crisis. The explosive rate of growth simply can't continue. And while we're at it, I want to point out a few more. Uh, John Stuart Mill, great 19th century philosopher, said, Solitude, in the sense of being often alone, is essential to any depth of meditation or of character. And solitude in the presence of natural beauty and grandeur is the cradle of thoughts and aspirations which are not only good for the individual, but which society could ill do without. Nor is there much satisfaction in contemplating the world with nothing left to the spontaneous activity of nature. Every hedgerow or superfluous tree rooted out, and scarcely a place left where a wild shrub or flower could grow without being eradicated as a weed in the name of improved agriculture. The former US President Bill Clinton told the United Nations in 1993 that to ensure a healthier and more abundant world, we simply must slow the world's explosive growth in population. And his Vice President Al Gore said, quote, I consider the dramatic growth in the world's population to be the greatest challenge currently facing the environment. He said the effects of this rapid increase are felt around the globe. Starvation, deforestation, and lack of clean water are just some of the problems. And finally, on the issue of racism, we just have to toughen up a bit and accept that it will happen. And that if we're going to win, we can't run away from this issue just because people will call us names. There are people out there who will look you in the eye and they will put their hand on their heart and swear black and blue that they are progressives, that they are left of centre, but they will not touch population because they are scared of being called names. But this is very ironic given that the most common characteristic I find in the people who I've come across in my work on the population issue is compassion. Many of you are motivated by compassion for the environment, uh, compassion for other living creatures. You do not think that it's all right to trample species after species into extinction on our relentless growth path. Others are motivated by compassion for the poor of the world and feel deeply about the plight of the poor and the great disparity of wealth uh, between globally rich and poor. You see population growth as the great obstacle to lifting the poor out of poverty. It is ironic in the extreme, therefore, that we have a couple of argent provocateurs out there accusing us of trying to hijack the environmental movement when we are the most fair income environmentalists you will find. And, and, and I defy anyone to challenge the environmental credentials of uh, Jacques Cousteau, who's devoted his entire life to marine conservation. Cousteau said, we must alert and organise the world's people to pressure world leaders to take specific steps to solve the two root causes of our environmental crises, exploding population growth and wasteful consumption of irreplaceable resources. He says, overconsumption and overpopulation underlie every environmental problem we face today. I defy anyone to challenge the environmental credentials of Captain Paul Watson, the founder of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, who has spent his life risking injury and imprisonment to harass Japanese whalers. He says, quote, the accusation that a stand to reduce immigration is racist is music to the ears of those who profit from the cheap labour of immigrants. They are the same people who love to see environmentalists make fools of themselves. And he says, and there is no environmentalist more foolish than one who refuses to confront the fact that uncontrolled human population growth is the number one cause of the world's increasing environmental problems. And does anyone think that Sir David Attenborough, with a lifetime behind him of educating and advocating for the protection of our rainforests and other wilderness areas, a bogus environmentalist, David Attenborough, describes global population increase as frightening, saying, I've seen wildlife under mounting human pressure all over the world, and it's not just from human economy or technology. Behind every threat is the frightening explosion in human numbers. He said, I've never seen a problem that wouldn't be easier to solve with fewer people, or harder and ultimately impossible with more. Well, 
Uh, I'm not scared of being called names. I don't enjoy it, but I dislike a whole lot more the fact that instead of the optimistic view I had of political progress when I was young, that we were getting better at looking after the environment, mm -hmm. that we'd learned from our mistakes, that we were going to stamp out global hunger and poverty, that we'd stop going to war, that in fact we're going backwards. Environment, war, waste, terrorism, global poverty, extreme weather and so on. Mm -hmm. And I dislike more the fact that this, this has happened during my political lifetime and that I've been quite unable to stop it. Being an MP is a great opportunity and privilege and with my remaining time as an MP, I want to do everything I can to turn this around. <laughs> I want to put forward an alternative, a smart alternative, to the direction we are going in now, which I absolutely believe is the wrong direction. At the heart of this smart alternative is the idea of stewardship. I got the word from my sister Jackie. Uh, she is a strong Christian. Uh, I don't have any religious beliefs. But you will have heard the phrase, uh, we don't inherit the earth from our parents, we borrow it from our children. And I think that's spot on. We don't own the place, we have the privilege of managing it for a while. And I regularly finish speeches by saying that we have an obligation to hand on the world to our children and to our grandchildren in as good a condition as the one that our parents and our grandparents gave to us. And I think that stewardship is a good word to express this fundamentally crucial idea. I've decided I like it better than sustainability. Uh, you could fill libraries with the work done on sustainability and properly understood it is indeed a powerful and useful idea. But sadly, it has been used and abused and prostituted, including by the forces of darkness, so that it's become an Alice in Wonderland word. You know, it means pretty much whatever I want it to mean, and so effectively meaningless. So when you hear the word sustainability in future, the substitute for it the word stewardship. I find it works pretty well. The second thing about the smart alternative is that it is very mainstream or middle of the road. I believe in giving the voters what they want. People who believe in giving the voters what they want are, again, at risk of being called names. Uh, for example, populist. But the people who scream populist are essentially trying to support, uh, fool us into supporting ideas that are not in our own best interests. Uh, people who scream populist reveal a basic contempt for the people and their ideas and a lack of respect for democracy. Again, if we are going to succeed, we have to be strong enough to put up with a bit of name calling because population is not about race, it is about stewardship. <laughs> Some people will think my ideas are radical because they are very different from the path that we're on at the moment. Uh, some will think them conservative because they place a lot of value on our heritage and value the past and are sceptical about the changes that are happening in our world. Indeed, I, I sometimes think my ideas are more conservative than those of the Liberal Party, better for the workers than those of the Labor Party, and better for the environment than those of the Greens. But, but at their heart is giving the voters what they want, not what some billionaire or their media puppets think is good for them. Another element of my ideas, again consistent with giving people a genuine say, is making things as small and local and self-sufficient as possible. Globalisation has helped a lot of people, but it's also harmed plenty. And in the world of the future, we'll be better off retaining as much independence and self-reliance and self-sufficiency as we can. And given that, and because we have to start somewhere, I want to focus on Victoria first. Victoria has a greater population increase each year than any other state or territory give, driven by having the largest migration intake. What on earth is the value of this? We're told that the big increase in Australia's migrant worker programs is to meet the needs of the mining boom and to find workers for remote and inhospitable parts of Australia that locals won't live in. That's the myth. The reality is that more people come to Victoria than anywhere else and that Victoria ends up with all the problems associated with this rapid population growth. Melbourne has 200 extra people a day, 1,500 a week, 75,000 each year. In my view, 
Melbourne and Victoria is the archetypal example of the folly of rapid population growth. And for me, as Melbourne and Victorian born and bred, it is exactly the place to start a fight back, to push back against this foolishness and short-sightedness. So what is Victoria first going to do? Well, there are many things that we could do, but first and foremost, we have to grow. You probably know that exponential growth is behind the population problems the world has. But I want us to make exponential growth work for us. How will we grow? Of course, any and all suggestions to do this are welcome. And I need and value your assistance in this mighty enterprise. Uh, but my ideas are as follows. Uh, first, enjoy the summer. Uh, I I love the Australian way of life, the, the warm summer nights and the caravan parks down by the beach, not, not sand overshadowed by high rise, cricket on TV. So I want to save that, not spoil it. So have a rest and enjoy the summer. But I, I do want you to do three things over the summer. First, join. You will see the membership forms down the back, cost $10. Uh, if people think that's too much, I can change that. This is not about money, it is about something much more valuable, your time and your energy and your abilities. And if you don't join today, please take the membership form and join later. Uh, we've had uh, many apologies, in fact as many apologies as there are uh, people in the room. So uh, I, I think we're in uh, very good shape in that regard. Second, take one or more of the takeaways that are there, the, the speeches that are on the table, uh, read them one day when you're sunning yourself somewhere. And third, when you have those family or office or neighbourhood get-togethers where you're down on the beach or up on the Murray River talking to someone in the tent next to you, talk to them gently. Gently, don't ram it down their throats. No one likes being lectured. Talk to them about population and stewardship. And somewhere in your family, in your workplace, in your street, in your holiday spot, find someone else who will join up. Because if you all join up, the people who have apologised told me they'll join up, well, we'll start with well over 100, and by February uh, 1st next year, let's make it 200. If everyone here finds one other person in the next couple of months, we will accomplish that. With a couple of hundred people, uh, we can let a box of federal electric. I know a bit about those things. Uh, it's, <laughs> It's up to me to find the, the money and to get the leaflets printed. All help will be great to receive, but it's up to me to accomplish that. And of course, not everyone can let a box, but I'm hoping that in your elaborate network and complicated circle of obligations given and favours received and the like, that you can find someone to do that for you. And if we can do that every month or a couple of months next year, we could build up to a thousand by this time next year. Might prove to be easy, might prove to be very ambitious, but it's a target, it's a goal. And then the year after that, we could use our thousand members to build up to 10,000, because then we will be taken seriously. We could have a rally now, but we'd be ignored, almost certainly by the media and certainly by governments. And even with a membership of a thousand, in a state of several million, uh, we will still be ignored and overlooked. But if we have 10,000 and can turn half of them out to a rally outside Parliament House or the Melbourne Town Hall or Property Council, then they'll listen to us. And of course we can support and be involved in campaigns which reinforce our message. Uh, a few metres away from here they want to build a freeway through Royal Park and uh, over what's left of the Mooney Ponds Creek. That's a disgrace. Let's fight that. Uh, and my council, Moreland, has released draft planning zones, or daft planning zones, that would enable high-rise to move right through the beautiful single-storey detached dwellings, suburbs like Brunswick West, Pasco Vale and Oak Park. Let's fight that. And I, I'm up for innovative ideas on spreading the message. Uh, use social media, of course. Uh, taking our leaflets and membership application forms to places where people are feeling the sharp edges of population growth. 
CBD car parks for motorists have been stuck in traffic jams, council meetings and VCAT hearings where residents are being done over by developers, universities where students are facing ferocious competition in the job market, maybe even auctions where young people are missing out on a, a home of their own, senior citizens clubs where older people struggle to pay the bills for our infrastructure expansion. We need to find the people who are suffering from rapid population growth, support them and recruit them. Let me conclude with something from uh, Edward Kennedy. Uh, his speeches were undoubtedly some of the finest of the 20th century. And the, the, the speech he gave for his uh, second assassinated brother, Robert, uh, had the, the passages that, that everyone will remember. Uh, my brother need, need not be idealised or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. And the other one, uh, some men see things as they are and say why. I dream things that never were and say why not. But before he said those things, in this most memorable of speeches, he said the following. Few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues, the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or great intelligence. Yet it is the one essential, vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. And I believe that in this generation, those with the courage to enter the moral conflict will find themselves with companions in every corner of the globe. I believe that as well. My fellow Victorians, I believe it is time that we went out and found ourselves some companions in this little corner of the globe. Thank you.